Imagine if a scientist found a cure to cancer but couldn't reproduce it. I know this may sound far-fetched, but it's actually quite likely to happen. In fact, it's estimated that we waste around $28 billion every year due to research that cannot be reproduced. And if you're trying to wrap your head around that number, that turns out to be around $900 wasted every second. But beyond the monetary problem is the fact that if we cannot reproduce experiments, it means slower research. And slower research means fewer discoveries. It means fewer cures. It means fewer vaccines. Ultimately, it undermines our ability to fight diseases like Ebola and Zika. But in order to understand some of the underlying causes of this reproducibility crisis, I must first introduce you to the laboratory. The laboratory is sort of a fancy kitchen with very expensive equipment, like the pipette. You can think of it as a very precise measuring cup. And the vortexer, which allows you to mix things up, much like the mixer you would have on your counter at home. And a centrifuge, which allows you to spin samples down. And then there are these two, the lab notebook and the timer. The lab notebook allows you to write things down and collect your observations, while the timer allows you to control exactly how long you spend on each step of your recipe. Now, this is important because you see, when you're in the lab, you're wearing gloves. You're wearing gloves all the time and you're using your hands to control what happens, to do every step of the experiment. Here's a video of my friend Lisa, who's very good at this, by the way. Not that good. <laughs> <laughs> this is a sped up video. She's combining small parts of DNA for her experiment. Now, if she makes a mistake, now she has to three things to do. One, take off her gloves, stop what she's doing, and then write down her observations on paper or something else. The problem, though, is that we have far more advanced tools in our daily lives. We walk around with supercomputers in our pockets, ones that are equipped with voice assistants that you may be familiar with. Right. The issue is that these voice assistants are more tailored to help you order pizza or find the latest sport results right, than they are helping you to do your experiment in the lab. My team and I looked at this problem and we knew there had to be a better way. We asked ourselves, what if we had a voice assistant that was able to help scientists in the lab do their experiments more reproducibly? Let me introduce you to Darwin. Here, Darwin is going to help Lisa take a note with nothing but her voice. Lisa speaks, Darwin, take a note, that I use the blue stain. Darwin will record that, transcribe it, and just keep it. It will collect all this information automatically and make it available for review later. With all of that information at her fingertips, Lisa can now review that information and see what worked and what didn't in her experiment ultimately making reproducibility much, much easier. But beyond taking notes, Darwin is also capable of recalling information and calculating in ways that humans are not good at. Here's an example of Darwin being used to find the optimal temperature for an experiment. Lisa asks, which temperature should I use? And Darwin will respond, Lisa recommends 34 degrees C, but most use 
36 degrees. This is extremely important because now you have the ability to access a much larger pool of knowledge than you had access to before. Today, you would have to go around and survey each one of your colleagues and ask them, which temperature did you use? Or you could read the literature, which is a considerable feat, and compile your own analysis of which temperature people use. What if those scientists are not around? What if you have to rely on these antiquated methods to find all the vital details that you need to get your experiments off the ground? That's the world we live in today. <coughs> now, I showed you how Darwin is helpful <coughs> to take notes and help scientists in the lab do their job more reproducibly. But you see, Darwin is really good at giving you small amounts of information when you need it. But for larger volumes, we needed something else. The ideal there would be to be able to see this data emerge right from the laboratory, right in the physical space where you generated it. The problem is that the vast majority of data that we deal with today is in digital form, which leaves scientists to print and paste their data in their lab notebook. You would think I'm joking. <laughs> Using an augmented reality display, however, you can actually show this digital data right there in physical space, something that was not possible before. In fact, when I put this device on my head, I have the ability to see data directly on the equipment. Let me show you what that looks like. What you see here is real-time calculated information from a number of different sources visible directly on top of the physical equipment. Now, the technologies that I showed you today are not theoretical. We recently deployed a version of our system with a laboratory, and we improved the precision of a scientist by more than 20 times. 20 times was even our first try. So if you remember anything from today's talk, is that we must reinvent the way we do biomedical research. We have to build tools that augment our scientists because frankly, we can't afford to do anything else. Thank you. <laughs>